welcome to everyone to uh, is attending this presentation. Uh, this is a presentation on the journey of grief and with some resources for those of us who are dealing with grief right now, uh, or maybe our loved ones or family members are dealing with grief. Uh, this can be both for healthcare uh, workers as well as for members of the community, because right now with the pandemic and because we're in a hospital and hospital environment, we will be dealing with grief and we come across grief or sometimes an environment of grief where we're in the midst of other people around us who are grieving. Grief is not well known. It's not well known as a process. So my name is Dennis McCann. I am the chaplain or a per diem chaplain at Middlesex Hospital and also um, head of the Center for Mindfulness and Compassion. And we try and work with people in the community as well as staff to help us navigate some of the, the rough patches in our emotional life in, in healthcare. Our first uh, thing I'd like to go through is the journey of grief. Grief doesn't have many words to it. They're hard. It's hard, you know, when you're in grief, but people say, how are you feeling? Well, I'm sad or I'm depressed or I'm kind of distracted. There may be a lot of different words that come up for it, but it's hard to get a handle on grief. Grief is not one of those things, fortunately, that we have a lot of practice in. Grief is hard to teach because you really got to be there. And once you are there, then you are looking for words and expressions of what is this like? What, what's happening to me? So we begin on a journey of grief. We're going to have a little slide here of the, the, the different things that people feel along the journey. The journey looks like it goes in stages. It's quite uh, popular to talk about the four or five stages of grief, but the stages are different for everyone. And sometimes you can stay in one stage, you might say, or you may even get along and then you come back to that stage again. So there's not great predictors in terms of a time frame, but they are good predictors in terms of the kinds of things and experiences that you're going to be feeling internally. And it helps to be able to put words on these. So the first thing we see on the journey of grief, on our map of grief, is loss. Grief is always about around loss, and certainly the most profound loss of other, our partners or of our parents or of our children. That kind of a loss is huge and can be very, very traumatic. Other losses can be like losing a job, losing uh, finances, losing some kind of stability, even our, our health. Um, those can be also can cause us grief. So that can be a, a factor that we kind of get hit with that's out of our control and we're suddenly uh, kind of caught and not really recognizing myself in this state. One of the first um, uh, programs we come through, you might say, or kind of series of feelings, is under the theme of protest. We don't want that to happen. We did not want that to happen. I did not want to lose my husband or my wife. I did not want to lose my, my child. So it's a protest about it. And one of the ways the body survives that is it goes into kind of a shock. We're kind of numb for a while. And, and someone has to say, are you, are you there? Are you with us? Because we just haven't been able to even hear it. A doctor comes or a neighbor comes and gives you some bad news. And you're in such shock, you don't even quite take it all in at once. From that shock, people talk about numbness, feeling kind of numb. Uh, or confused. Confusion is, is often in that early stage. What's happening to me? Who did what? Am I responsible? Is this my fault? Uh, which is one of the other feelings in this protest stage is guilt. Even though we may have nothing whatsoever to do with the loss directly, we feel somehow or another we are guilty. We feel somehow or another we are responsible. And some of that also causes anger. We can be very angry. And you may even down the road, you know, a few months later, think of the, uh, that you're, you're angry about something or at someone. But actually the, the root of your anger is really from the loss you've gone through. So anger and guilt are two of those unseen things that are kind of look like they're connected to something else, but at root, 
those are often part of that protest stage of, of, of loss. And then lastly, the, in this stage are physical symptoms. People often talk about how difficult it is to sleep at night. When they wake up at three in the morning, eyes wide open, like they haven't slept at all, and immediately you're, you're, you're going through the loss in your mind, you're going through this experience. Sometimes people have cramps, stomach things start to tighten up. You can't take in food, you don't want to eat much, or you can't stop eating, all you want is ice cream. Uh, other things might be uh, aches and pains. I remember going through my own loss, uh, how much, how physical it was. I felt like someone had dumped me off the back of a truck. I was just totally stiff and, and achy everywhere. And, and it went on for, for weeks. I never thought that that had any, anything to do with, with the loss or my grief. But in fact, it's very common. We will feel physical pain physically uh, exhaustion, being really, really tired, wiped out, that feeling too. Again, sometimes tied to not getting a good sleep. Um, and that's part of that experience. So if you know that when you're feeling off during this experience, just think, be mindful. I wonder if this is tied to my loss. Where am I right now in my loss? This is why it's great in grief groups, we can talk with other people who are going through loss and when they start to express what they're experiencing, you say, oh, that's what this is. I'm experiencing the same thing. And it's, it's very comforting to know that uh, you are not alone. This is part of the reaction. This is normal. And there's something very satisfying in that, or at least some comfort in that, that this is normal. In fact, people come to grief groups and their motivation just for coming to a grief group is to find out Am I going crazy or is this normal? The next stage that we go through is we go through all that interior and physical shock of it all is searching. This is another stage where we begin to, we are restless. Uh, we are often preoccupied, going over and over again, can't quite figure out what this means for me. Often there's family dissonance. People start getting angry at each other in the family. For example, there was a, two sisters came to, uh, uh, to a grief group and they were talking about it together and they loved each other. They got on famously and they were, were wonderfully you know, kind of bound at the hip kind of sisters. And they had to take their mother to a nursing home and put her in a nursing home uh, because she had had dementia and it was just going too far now. They couldn't care for her anymore. And they said, as they dropped her off all the way back from the, the uh, getting her into the home and meeting everybody and getting everything done and getting all that on the way home, they, did, they fought all the way back home in the car. And they didn't know that they're not used to fighting. They, they couldn't believe they were talking to each other the way they were talking to each other. And it was a grief. It was part of their grief experience. Again, it kind of traces back to anger, to guilt, uh, but that family dissonance, it can become very unraveled. We used to talk about it as long as cliche, you know, when the, the head of the family, the matriarch of the family uh, passes away, the whole family falls apart. That's actually grief and it is not uncommon, but the reason for it is grief. So it's just good to be aware of that. You can see it coming and then know how to address it, know where to take it. And the last uh, comment on, on this searching stage, is lowered self-esteem. Again, because we often kind of blame ourselves. We often are in that mood of, of guilt. Uh, we feel uh, in, incapable of taking on anything more. Uh, or I'm not, not worthy, I'm not good enough, I'm not able enough. Uh, when Joe was alive, he did everything in the house. I don't even know how to turn a light bulb now, turn, you know, put in a new light bulb. Uh, I'm totally overwhelmed. With, my, with this grief. And so you may find your self-esteem begins to crash. Also part of grief, you wouldn't think it was, but that really is, is part of grief. And just knowing that, you can turn that around a bit and start being easy on yourself because there's not a reality in it. It's just the reaction of, of grief. You are the same person you have been for the last 10 years, but this is just throwing you off your game. And that happens again, commonly. 
to many of us. The next stage is the lowest stage, and that is a stage of despair. And in that stage, there's agony and anguish, there's depression, alone, aloneness, meaninglessness. What is life for? What is this all about? Uh, that's a very common, there's a common valley to visit, but none, not one you want to drop into. So we always advise anybody who has been through depression, if it's depression has been part of anxiety, has been part of your kind of profile as a person, and you've needed to have support for it before from a, from a doctor or a therapist, um, this is a good time to reconnect with the doctor and the therapist because we need extra support uh, through that valley of despair. And it may even be something totally new for you. You may never have had this kind of depression or, or this feeling of meaninglessness before. Uh, so it could kick off something in you that needs to be addressed. And there's no shame in that. You want to try and find your, your, your GP or a doctor and then we'll put you on to a therapist. And maybe medication might be helpful for a time. Uh, grief is a normal is a normal thing to go through. But if we have, we're carrying other things with it, it can be just too much. It can be really overpowering. So I want to really take care of ourselves and really give ourselves a lot of self-compassion. Eventually and slowly we begin to rise out of these difficult stages and begin to reorganize our lives around who we are now. It's really rediscovering yourself in this new you that has been through uh, this kind of hell of grief and loss. So you might find eventually you get these new bursts of energy. You might find, uh, uh, you might still have fatigue, sometimes indifference to things, but it's not so powerful. There might be some apathy, some detachment to life, but it's not overpowering. We begin to kind of rise up to who are you now? What are you gonna do with this? How are you gonna use this, this loss, this pain? Who are you now in this kind of new world that you stepped into? Remember going through my own losses and, and there are two types of losses they talk about. One is kind of the long anticipated loss where someone is sick for a long time and you're taking care of them and you're going to the doctors and having different treatments and so on. And with uh, slowly it gets, it dawns on you or someone expresses to you that this is probably not going to be a, a long life at this point for your husband or wife or parent or whomever. Uh, that's that long and gradual thing. When it actually happens, grief is the same. Loss is loss. If someone can be in hospice for months and the family comes and visits and everything seems good, but when that final announcement comes that they have passed, they have died. That is a shock and we go right into, into grief. Sometimes we can go into what's called anticipatory grief. And that is that as soon as someone tells you that the one you love has a terminal illness, you might begin grieving almost immediately going to some of these experiences of grief. So it's good to get support right away as soon as you're aware that something has shifted. Something is not the same now. And you're feeling anxiety and worry and maybe a little anger as well. Uh, before the person has even passed. But that's why you want to keep an eye kind of on yourself all through this process and why it's good again to go to grief groups, talk to other people maybe who've been through grief and to download this little map of grief that we use. Uh, these words on it are all on that little map. It's uh, downloadable from this site. And that will also give you a little guidance about what to do now at this stage. The other more difficult type of grief is called complicated grief. And that's when something happens suddenly. You're not, the person has not been sick for a long time. The person is not very elderly, so you wouldn't expect this to happen. I've been through both the loss of a wife and the, when, uh, we were in our early forties and, and a loss of a child who was a, a four-year-old which was complicated grief and did not see it coming. And there's something really wrong about our children die before we do. That whole life is upside down. That whole 
trajectory we expect to, to be on when we are putting our lives together and marrying and having children and so on, suddenly it turns on its head. That's complicated grief and that certainly needs um, help and support with people who are really skilled at, at navigating this journey of grief. That needs extra support and help. And we should certainly ask for that help. That is my, my, my main credentials in grief really are, I'm taking many, many courses and read many, many books, but no teacher is like the experience that you've had. So that's the, that's the general journey of what we're going through. And again, you can see that below uh, and print that out for yourself. There's another thing that someone put together some years ago, and it's on the internet. You can look it up, but you can also download this below. And that's called the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights of the Brief. And it's, it's a good guide because you're not sure what to do. You're not really sure who you are right now. So you're very susceptible to what's going, uh, other people, uh, how they react to you, how they speak to you. Uh, grief takes time and in other people's lives who are not in the same grief, but they know that you are, three weeks or three months should be like, okay, well, let's get back to normal now. Let's get, you know, let's get your, back on our game. And it doesn't happen that way at all. But people who are in grief or never had grief don't know that. We who are in grief say, wait a minute, I am not ready to, to move forward yet. I am still in deep. Uh, I'm not ready to kind of let it go and get on with my life. Um, that's not going to happen. So we can get very irritated by people who, uh, as well-meaning as they may be, to kind of like get us back to, to normal. So one of the first thing that is on this Bill of Rights is do not make me do anything I do not wish to do. So you do not have to go and clean out the closet that his clothes were in or sell the car that she drove or do anything that you don't feel comfortable doing. Whatever you feel right now is, is as much as you want to do, you decide and don't let other people tell you. When we're numb, we may go along with it because we're numb, we go not even thinking about it and then have regrets later on that I wish I had kept that or I wish I hadn't sold that. Whatever. So you don't want to go through the regrets of it. The advice in grieving is don't do anything different for one year. Don't move. Don't change the house. Don't, don't do anything. You may clean out the closet and send things to goodwill and that sort of thing at your own pace during the year. But don't make any big changes. Don't move to Florida or something. You know, in the midst of this, and when you get down there and you're really, you'll start longing for, I wish I was home. I wish I was still in that house. I sold the house too fast or whatever. Another, the second uh, tip here is to let me cry. Crying is really, really therapeutic and very, very helpful. We want to be around people who would allow us to cry. So that if someone comes up to you, say, don't cry, don't cry. Understand that they don't know how important it is that we do cry. <laughs> so allow yourself to cry. It also says, allow me to talk about the deceased. You need to talk about, and it's okay to talk about the person you've lost. Other people try and change the subject because they think you're getting more sad by talking about him or talking about her. But it's actually really good to do that. There was one woman in the grief groups, I remember who her husband was a firefighter and he, he died uh, in one of the, uh, one of the fires they're uh, addressing. And, she never went down to the firehouse or hung out with the guys that he would you know, be with. And after he died, she went down once a week at least on Saturday mornings, just sit around and hear the guys tell stories about Joe, whoever he was uh, and what he was like and tell jokes and they'll even talk about themselves. She just, it was a way of her even being kind of near him, kind of having some of him still present. So talking about the deceased is a way of keeping them present for us. It's okay to do that. It's fine to do that and try and find people though who are, don't get upset by you talking about it, about him or her. The children, it might be too much for them to hear, it. but for friends, uh, or certainly a grief group, uh, that's common. Again, number four is do not uh, force me to make quick decisions. It's kind of like the first one, don't make me do anything I don't want to do, but also don't make quick decisions. We're not in a good space mentally to, 
to make anything that's important kind of decisions. Don't do any banking decisions or don't be subject to uh, uh, to salespeople and what they want to buy and what they want to sell you. Uh, just take your time. Be gentle with yourself. This will, this is a journey and this this takes time. But the number five is let me act strange sometimes. When we are in grief, we will act strange sometimes. We will be you be in the stop and shop and you're going down the aisle and you come and come promise cereals and you start to cry because you're staring at this, his favorite Wheaties or whatever you would eat every morning and suddenly, or that soup or whatever it was, and suddenly it just wells up inside of you and it catches you off guard. You didn't see that coming even in yourself. So to other people that may be strange, but actually it's very normal to do that. It's okay to do that. That will happen. It's good to know that in advance. But it's also good for other people to let them see you grieving, especially family members. Let them know that this is that you are grieving and it's okay to, to, to grieve with me and to let me let me grieve, even at family parties. And even if it is Christmas, well, we'll have a drink at the, the toast at the table for him or her, and we may have a moment of, of sadness there. It's okay. Uh, when I am angry, do not discount it. You will definitely get angry sometimes at things that don't seem r relevant. Other times at things that do seem relevant. I remember a man coming into the grief group and he just come from one of the shops and a person just walked ahead of him and slammed the door before he was even there. He said, it was so rude. He was so angry at this person being so rude. So back in the old days, we used to wear black armbands. So you knew this person is in grief. So be gentle and be considerate of them. He said, there's no sign anymore that we're in grief. We don't wear black anymore or anything. So other people just kind of trample over you without even knowing how much pain you're in. So that can happen and that will trigger your anger. And it's okay, but just know that this is where it's coming from. Uh, do not speak to me in platitudes. That's number eight on our list of 10 things here. So you'll get a lot of those hallmark cards or people will say, uh, cliche and sometimes in main things like uh, he's in a better place now i remember one woman <laughs> at the grief group saying what was wrong with my, with uh, being in my house right next to me in my bed he was fine right there but he's in a better place now that sort of thing or god fits the burden to the back you know those sort of old cliches that are not very helpful right now to us they don't help uh so people should know don't <laughs> don't read hallmark cards out to me uh, the ninth is, listen to me, please. You have something to say. People do need to listen. People try and avoid the subject and stop you from talking because they don't want you to go there and they don't want you to bring them there. But you've got to be listened to and it's okay. You have the right to be listened to. And they've got to understand that. That even if it takes me to a grief place, to a sad place, it's okay. I'll survive it. But I'll be in a much worse place if I don't even get to talk about it and express it. And then lastly, is forgive me my trespasses, my rudeness, and my thoughtlessness. It's very common during uh, this one grief. For example, at Christmas time, you usually, traditionally, you don't send out cards to people. Uh, you're not in a place to sit down and write cards. Or you're not in a place to even decorate the house, maybe. Uh, you'll get phone calls. You know, there'll be people leaving messages. You're not going to have the energy, maybe, or the desire to call back. And that's okay. People just need to forgive you. The usual kind of niceties in life and maybe even the way you have operated before of always getting back to people and, and looking after them. Not now, not right now. You will, but not right now. And they'll have to catch on to that. So this is a good bill of rights to put on your fridge so everyone else in the family can see it. And they kind of get to know where you're at and what you're going through. But lastly, there's one more list that is really helpful as well. And that's called the 12 freedoms of healing and grief. And these 12 freedoms also guide us in understanding our grief. And the first one is you have the freedom to realize your grief is unique. None of us grieve the same way. We're all in different stages of life. We're all in different ways we heal. We heal in different ways in which we, we manage our our, our pain. So your grief will be unique and that is fine. So that you know that in advance, that's fine. 
you have the freedom to talk about your grief. We covered that also in our, in our uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, you have the freedom to expect to feel a multitude of emotions. And you will get emotions that will come up without warning. In the middle of the driving or whatever, suddenly something might come up that causes you a lot of pain for that moment. And like the cereal situation in the in stop and shop kind of thing, the supermarket. It's okay. Yeah, but but but, but we'll beware, it's gonna happen. It does happen. Uh, the uh, number uh, four is that you have the freedom to allow for numbness. You know, some days you're just gonna stare out a window and people are gonna be maybe a little bit nervous about that. You know, or is she losing her mind? <laughs> is he finally going off the rails? Uh, numbness is okay. Sometimes we just need to sit with it and just be numb for the day. The subconscious is kind of working on what it needs to do to repair us. But outside here, we're just numb. We just cannot relate to anything. And that's okay. You have the freedom to be tolerant of your physical and emotional limits. Remember, you will not have as much energy as you did uh, prior to, to the grief experience. So be gentle with yourself, be easy with yourself. In a lot of things you're not gonna say, I'm not gonna go out to the park, I'm not gonna babysit the kids tonight, I'm not gonna be driving to get, pick up things for you. I just don't have the energy right now to do that. And that's fine. And number six, you have the freedom to experience grief attacks or memory embraces. And sometimes things will come on, let's say like a, you listen to the radio and a song comes on. And you always associate that song with him, or maybe that was a song at your wedding, or that was his favorite song, or the type of music was his or her favorite kind of music. Uh, those memory embraces will come back, and they can be painful. They can hijack the moment for you for a moment. Just be aware that's part of the grief experience. And if you need to pull over in the car, pull over. Don't try and drive through tears. Not safe. Let yourself just step out of the situation you're in, or pull over the car, or even turn off the music if it's just too much, or turn off the TV show, something on that comes up. I remember one person who was, uh, every Saturday, she would watch uh, baseball with her husband. They had their two chairs watching TV, and she never liked baseball. So she would make snacks for him and cook for him and you know, keep him you know, uh, happy while he watched his baseball game. Uh, but once he passed, she uh, watched every baseball game from then on. She was, it was a way of being close to him. You'd watch the, the, she was from New York, they watched the Yankees. And uh, that was her way of staying connected to him. It was like he was still there. His chair was still there. It was, it was like he was still in it. That's okay, that's fine. That's not madness, that's grief. So you have the freedom to develop a support system and maybe different from, from the people you have had before maybe new people, going out with other couples might be difficult now, even though they were good friends with you both. Maybe uh, other um, friends now who are maybe single or didn't know him before or her before, uh, that's okay. You have the freedom to make use of ritual. And some people, you know, they keep a picture on the bedside and they kiss him or her goodnight every, every night before they go to bed. That's okay, that ritual is fine. When they come in the house and they say, honey, I'm home, even though they know that, that she's no longer there or he's no longer there, but you shout it into the house. And that's okay. That's a ritual. It's a way of staying connected. Some people go to the graveyard. They go to the gravesite and bring flowers. Some people won't even drive on the same road as the gravesite, uh, the, tent, the cemetery. It's fine. Whichever, it, both are fine. Whatever it is that you need, whatever ritual helps you to get through this is just perfectly uh, you have the freedom to embrace your spirituality. Sometimes spirituality is helpful. If you guys went to church every Sunday together, whatever, this may, may be hard now to, to be in, in that church or to be at that same, maybe that same service each week. They may feel uh, things might come up for you when you see other people who are still together as couples. And now you're back to that place again, but you're alone now. Uh, that can be hard. But just be aware of that and shift things around to make it easier for yourself to go to a different service or even a different church or whatever it, it, it takes for you to, to manage your pain. 
caring for yourself, self-compassion is key in every part of this journey. And number 10, you have the freedom to allow a search for meaning. And each of us puts some meaning together about life and people and our own autobiographies in any way we find helpful. And that's fine. It may be a different meaning now in life than you had before. 11, you have the freedom to treasure your memories. And so little things that family will come in and throw away for you may be a relic. Uh, people still will wear, you know, his, wear his, where's his hat? Or at night you uh, put on her, his robe because it feels close. That becomes a, a relic of him. That becomes something very sacred to you. A button that was in the top drawer that you meant to was so on to his shirt. Well, the button's still there. The button becomes something symbolic for you. It's okay. Keep that. Don't let people throw it away. You have the freedom then, lastly, to, to move forward uh, and toward your, your grief and, and healing. You, are, you have the freedom to let go. You have the freedom to move on. You eventually have the freedom to, to meet others and change your path of life. It might be different. Uh, that's okay. There should be no fear of that or, or apologies for that. Uh, we have the freedom to move. And those are the 12 freedoms of healing for grief. This is also downloadable. Good to talk to other people about it. Share it with family so they know what you're going through. And they may they know uh, what they're going through as well that they did not identify as grief. So this is what we are, are doing now. Those are, that's the general kind of architecture of this journey. And it's a sacred one and a very special one that really deserves, as painful as it is, deserves all of your attention, caring, and support. And towards that end, the hospital and, the, and our behavioral health and in our, our uh, chaplaincy program for the Department of Spiritual Care and in our heart, heart hospice program, You'll be hearing from different people. You'll be getting letters home for support if you have lost a loved one through that one of those um, uh, parts of the hospital, one of our programs. But even if you lost somebody from outside and you're, but you live here and you're going through it, please feel free to reach out to Middlesex Health as a support for you. Uh, and right now we can't do groups like we could before. So we are offering as much extra support now through Zoom uh, and through telephone. Uh, and down below also, you'll see some phone numbers to call. You're gonna see some little videos, of some people who would be who are reaching out to you to give you support. Uh, and you'll find some other resources uh, on the internet uh, as well as these downloadable pages. So I wish you, I wish you much, much peace and, and much and fast, I hope, healing, uh, but most importantly, profound healing. Uh, loss is deep and it's important. And so the journey you take with this is equally important. Much peace to all of you. Thank you for being here.